I'm going to be reading this morning from 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. And I decided to include the first four, first three verses to give us some context. So although the bulletin says I'll start at verse 4, I'll actually be starting at verse 1. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. And I'll try to speak over the plane or whatever that is up there. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods, little g, do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and he fled for his life and came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. He said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. Elijah looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. So Elijah got up, he ate and he drank. Then he went in strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the words of the legendary R&B singer extraordinaire Marvin Gaye, what is going on? In the previous chapter, Elijah, God's chosen prophet, had a dramatic public showdown with and defeated the prophets of Baal by calling up on the God of Israel to rain down fire from above and consume the sacrifice he had prepared. Elijah had been faithful in ex executing his call from God. Yet in today's text, Elijah is running for his life. He's afraid, despondent, and probably a little depressed. Although he was victorious and vindicated when he proved that the God of Israel was the only true and living God, Elijah is now under a death sentence as Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab, has declared that in 24 hours Elijah's life would be taken like that of the false prophets he had destroyed. Elijah fled to Beersheba a wilderness place under the jurisdiction of Judah and beyond Jezebel's reach or control. And even though he was safe outside of Jezebel's reach and the time that she promised to take his life had expired, Elijah was still shaken and he did not feel safe. He sat down despondently under a tree and declared that he was ready to die and then he boldly proclaimed that he had had enough. He had reached a breaking point and felt that he could not go on any longer. I suspect that if we're honest, we have all had times in our lives when we felt that we could not go any further. Times when we had absolutely had enough and believed that we could not take another step. I believe that we all remember times when we have looked at our community, our city, our nation, the world, and maybe our homes, and certainly in this church, and asked God, what is going on? And then declared, I've had enough. We have had enough of the gun violence. We cannot take another school shooting another black woman or man's life being taken needlessly by those sworn to protect and serve. We cannot bear one more senseless loss of life because state and federal legislators refuse to pass sensible gun laws. What is going on, God? We have had enough of endless wars. We can't bear any more babies dying in Gaza. 
We cannot bear any more people being taken hostage or hospitals being bombed. We cannot bear the continuing war in Ukraine or armed conflicts in many African countries. We cannot bear any more cities being completely wiped off the face of the earth to satisfy the egos of narcissistic dictators who dispatch bombs that land indiscriminately. What is going on, God? We have had enough of the natural disasters, the floods, the wildfires, the hurricanes and mudslides, and the deadly heat waves. The earth is boiling and praying its own desperate prayers as many continue to deny the existence and our complicity in climate instability. What is going on, God? We have had enough of the anger, misinformation, and political divisiveness. We can't bear any more leaders whose rhetoric fuels rage and spills into violence. We can't bear another family dinner or another family gathering or water cooler conversation where we tiptoe around each other's views because our political divisions have become so vitriolic. What is going on, God? Elijah, exhausted, disillusioned, desperate, and despondent, sat down under the shade of the broom tree in the wilderness and asked God to let him die. He did not want to go on any further. He could not physically, mentally, or spiritually go on. Terry Ott writes, it is in these lowest of low moments when we learn to be honest with ourselves and with God. When we are finally forced to confess that we can't do it all, that we aren't completely self-reliant, that we could use some help, Terry continues that it's important to note the kind of help that Elijah did and did not receive from God. End of quote. Beloved, God does not always show up the way we anticipate or want. I'm a witness to that. And God did not honor Elijah's request to die. God sent a messenger to provide Elijah with sustenance so that he could go a little further. And God does the same for us. When we feel like we have reached the point of complete exhaustion, when we feel we cannot put another foot in front of the other, when we feel we cannot endure another transition, God. Amen. Amen. God sends us what we need to go just a little further. It seems that we here at EOPC have been in a perpetual season of transition, a liminal space of already and not yet. Some of you already have, and others of you may be contemplating sitting down under a metaphorical tree and waiting to see what is next. God allowed Elijah to rest for a while, to have his pity party, and then God dispatched an angel to give Elijah something to eat and drink so that he could push forward out of his wilderness experience. Well, I stopped by this morning to remind us that the wilderness can be a place of desolation, of wandering and wondering, and the wilderness is a place of deep spiritual significance. It is a place to seek God. The wilderness experiences are also a place and time of testing, preparation, spiritual maturation, and transformation. Jesus spent 40 days and nights in the wilderness as he prepared for his earthly ministry. And while there, he was tested and tried by the accuser. And with God's help, Jesus did not bow down to the riches or the ruler of the world. He did not give in to the earthly desires of his flesh. And he came out of the wilderness prepared to do the will of God. EOPC, this is a time of wondering what is going on. But even more importantly, this is a time of preparation, spiritual maturation, and transformation. God is preparing us to continue to be the church God created us to be. A community of believers striving to follow God. 
not to idolize a particular person or pastor, present or future. This is a time for us to continue to be and grow as the body of Christ by baptizing children as we did this morning. Welcoming new members, going out into the rain garden and inviting our neighbors to come inside the walls of the church. And it is a time for us to stand and declare what is righteous and just and of God in the world. This is a time for us to prepare prayerfully discern where and to what God is calling us as we prepare for a new church year. And I might add, a new pastor. How is God calling us to love unconditionally? To be a refuge for spiritual growth? To pursue justice for the marginalized, the disenfranchised, and the oppressed? And to be a place where radical hospitality overflows? How is God preparing us? Or is God preparing us? After being fed and consuming the water, Elijah falls back asleep, and the messenger of God awakens him a second time, telling him to get up and eat. For if he does not eat and drink, the journey will be too much for him. In other words, Elijah, God still has work for you to do. You are not finished yet. God allowed Elijah to rest, to be nourished, and to be fortified, and then God sent him back out to do God's will. Terry Ott comments, the angel didn't magically and instantaneously make Elijah's life better or transport him to an earthly paradise where his worries would vanish. Rather, the angel came to Elijah to give him just enough so he could carry on. Beloved, God does not always answer our prayers the way we desire. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And God's ways are not our ways. God declares that just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways. We may want to hold on to what is familiar, what is comfortable, and, or we may want to give up and throw in the towel. But God gives us exactly what, when, and who we need in God's time. Not on the schedule or the time frame that we establish. After eating and drinking the second time, Elijah had consumed enough nourishment to go on for 40 days and 40 nights to reach Mount Horeb, God's appointed place. The same place where God revealed God's self to Moses. God gave Elijah exactly what he needed to take the next step and to keep pushing forward. I declare in the name of Jesus that God has given us everything we need to continue to move forward. Isaiah reminds us that even youth will faint and grow weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with Wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We may wonder what is going on in the world, our community, our households, our church, and yes, even our lives. They all may seem to be under siege. We may not understand why God allowed the changes and transitions we continue to experience in our church life and family. We may feel like we are just standing still or that the liminal space in which we inhabit is inconsequential. And all of that may be true. We may be in liminal space. And as followers of Christ, we are under the jurisdiction of Kairos time, the appointed time and purpose of God, who has provided everything that we need. And in Jesus Christ, nothing is inconsequential. I believe it was Paul who reminded us and the Christians in Rome that all things work together for good. Hallelujah. Woo, that's a shout point, y'all. <laughs> all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and who are called according to God's purpose. Even though we may be tired and weary and have had enough of the transitions and uncertainty, we're waiting on God. Are we not? We're waiting on God. That's the answer 
to what's going on. We're waiting on God. I don't know about any of you, but God has kept me through dangers seen and unseen. God has physically, mentally, and spiritually nourished me. And God has shown me the direction in which God wants me to go. So my hope and trust are in the Lord God who loves us unconditionally and who has never failed us. And I declare that I am standing on the word and promises of God. And I shall wait on and move when, where, and in God's time. And I pray that the same shall be so for us as a community of believers. That's what's up, as the kids would say. That's what's going on. Amen.